this evening if you would like to go ahead and uh, find your spot of choice um, most of you although I don't I did not send I forgot to send it out to the children's uh, as I've been trying to do the notes for class I apologize for that tonight um, you guys are here so often um, I almost take it for granted uh, so but tonight our uh, topic is the mission as lights unto the world and we've got a series of discussion points to work through as we think about the general subject of what it means to be a disciple of Christ um, under the premise of being an encouragement or a drawing point, as well as as it connects to the other half of this same um, dual pole. So on the one hand, the Bible tells us that Christians, the disciples of Christ, members of the kingdom serve as lights, as lampstands, as beacons of goodness. But on the other hand, we also have the teaching of Paul that says there's a drawing power that's separate from that, that draws people to Christ, and that's the cross. And so we're going to talk tonight about how our perspective of the world then is um, using that shaped idea to be good servants and good Christians. So at this time, though, we're going to bow our heads in prayer, and after all prayer, we'll begin our study. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the time we share together in Christ. We thank you for the blessings that are found in Jesus. It's our hope as disciples and as servants of Jesus that we offer our wholeness to you. Um, help us to make sure that in our service in the kingdom, we do so in a way that glorifies you, that glorifies the Spirit and your Son, Christ. Um, help us in the study tonight to be good students, to both know and then understand your will. Please forgive us of our sins, and we offer this prayer in your son's name. Amen. All right, so um, the general subject then again is thinking about um, the mission, if you will, of being disciples, being a light in the world that is um, seemingly dim. Uh, something that's really important is, and I was thinking about this in preparation for our study tonight, we really don't know what's going on beyond our immediate circumstances. And uh, I was having a conversation with a friend who grew up in Florida. He now lives here. Um, and I was talking about a completely unimportant, but I believe super important issue. That is, which state has the best state flag? And um, that's a, you're like, what's that going to do with anything? We'll get there. Please pay attention. So let me ask you this question. Which state do you think has the best state flag? Oregon. What's your reason there, Rich? No other flag has a beaver on it. That is correct. And the beaver is the B side of the flag. It's the only flag in the 50 United States flags that's two-sided with different images on the opposite side. I did not know that until I started getting some research together to figure this out after the conversation. And I knew someone in this class would say Oregon because there's at least one or two Oregon homers that are always here. Um, so second to Rich's opinion, what's another reason for you thinking you have a really great flag? Other great flags, state flags? You're not going to pipe up, uh, Matt? Oh, South Carolina. South Carolina confuses me because I see that flag and I don't think it's an American flag right away until I think about it, right? Because it looks so not part of the typical presentation of America. It's got like the moon and the, and the pine, or was it not pine, but a, what was that? Palmetto. Palmetto tree on it. And I go, that looks like it belongs in the Middle East. <laughs> and then my brain goes, no, that's South Carolina. Well, those are, that's actually flags number two and three, in my opinion. Because only one flag is the best flag. It has a bear on it. California's flag, best flag. And like, oh, you're like, why? Why does everyone turn down on that flag? Because of perception. Everyone perceives California based on a perception of it. How many people live in California? Too many. 14 million. What was that? 14 million. That's, that's low. It's something like 50, 60 million people live in California. Uh, and how many of you have spent more than a week in California? I know you guys in the back have. Some of the back setters. Bobby senses some time there. You guys spent more than a week there. Does that give you the ability to form a strong opinion of what people in California believe or think? Right or wrong, but it does. 
Well, we think it does, right? I spent a long time there, but it was a long time ago, right? I got friends and family out there. I know what they think, and they probably have more in common with us than we think they do because our perception is limited by our personal realities. That is, what can I see? Who do I interact with? And who do I get my news, my information from? So it's all perception. But in reality, those 55 to 60 million people, I don't know much about what they think because I don't see them all the time. In fact, I have zero influence upon most of them. And if I met someone from there and I came up to them and said, so, you're from California. How are you broken? How are they going to listen to me, right? Because... The perception is Californians got problems, right? Based on our appearance here and our quick survey. But is that actually factual? Some of the most moral people I know come from California. Some of the strongest, wisest people were born and raised there. You actually read articles from one guy all the time. A Doy Moyer guy. He's another West Coaster. And you read articles from him. A Californian is slipping into your influence. And some of you, like me, and I'm from California. Uh, and I still kind of claim it because that's where they got good tacos and some of the best vistas and views you can possibly find. And some of the most amazing people. Here's the thing to think about. When our goal is to be a light, we have to be a light where we're at. And all these things about perception, all the things you think might be wrong about others, and I'm just using California because I can pick on my own home state. They apply to us. Any one of those problems, I guarantee you, are represented within the boundaries of the state of Georgia, the metro area. In fact, I think they probably drive faster around uh, the loop at 285 than they do in most of the places in California because the cars are all stacked up in most of the freeways in SoCal. Um, but... Atlanta area, and Coweta County, all those problems. In fact, based on listening to current high school students compared to my high school experience, then I would go back to Foothill High School in a heartbeat versus any of the public schools around here, based on my remembrance of it, right? All those problems are there, they're everywhere. Our goal then is to rise beyond our perception of what we think things are, and really dig into what it means to be a disciple. Throw off all the shackles of, well, I'm from here, you're from there, and say, in the kingdom, who does God want me to be? Because my mission isn't to draw people to Georgia or to draw people out of California. My mission and our mission is to draw people to Christ and to the cross. And the minute we start making a confusion of those two things, we're going to fail at either of them. We're not going to be successful. Our goal then, again, is to think about the kingdom, our king, and how that looks. So there's a number of things we can pay attention to. And the first one I wanted to identify has to come with a general premise of fighting against temptation. You will never be a good light if temptation is not something you can temper. Um, in the text of James, there's a, a word that's used regularly for temptation as a root message or meaning of to test or to try. You're never going to escape temptation completely. Right? Is that We would all shake and nod and agree that we're never going to escape. How then do we become more successful at passing this test that James talks about. And we're going to look at Ephesians 6 in a minute too, by the way. But how do we become more successful at passing any test? The more you overcome temptation, the stronger you are and the easier it becomes to resist. So it's, uh, and this is exactly what I was thinking about. It's like thinking about how a rubber band works. So if I am in the middle of two rubber bands, and on both of these sides of this kind of pulling space 
are bad decisions either way. Because a lot of life is like that. And I decide to pull this way to avoid that problem over there. So yeah, I've, I've saved myself from this one, right? That's what I think. And there's no slack on this line. But what happens if you pull too far on a rubber band? It either snaps or it just whips you right back because you've now gotten so far that it's built up so much potential energy that you can't pull it anymore. And the minute it happens, it yanks you around. Life is a lot like that where you get pulled side by side. Well, maturity is learning to balance those things to a degree. You experience. And I, I can't get over on that edge, but I also can't be over there too. And so I've got to learn to be moderate in my behavior. So part of our answer to the question of surviving temptation is wisdom or experience. What else would be part of the equation? Rich? I think part of the wisdom and experience also uh, helps you create a game plan. So you should, you should at least have some scenarios that you know are troublesome for you. And then you should have an answer or an escape route or a plan when you come up against that particular scenario. Just like, you know, when Dad says, hey, there's nothing good happens after midnight, you should be home, right? And so understanding that what happens if you find yourself out after midnight, what are you going to do? You should have a plan. Yeah. Look, okay. and how many of our parents told us that truth? And how many of us had to learn it for ourselves? Yeah. <laughs> the same ratio, right? <laughs> Look, my, my parents told me that, I think. I'm old now, I can't remember. I told my kids that. I told myself that. Nothing good really ever happens after midnight. But you had to learn it too because we're dumb or foolish. We also make preparation to kind of have an answer. We told our kids at various times, hey, look, if you become uncomfortable in a circumstance and you're not willing to say, I don't want to be here, you're always welcome to say, my parents don't want me here. Especially when they were younger, uh, pre-teen to early teen, when they weren't necessarily always making formative personal decisions. Look, you want to make us look bad in front of your friends because you don't feel comfortable there? I'll take that hit every day. So we're giving them a pre-planned get out of that circumstance. As well as, look, if you're there with buddies and they drove you there and you can't get home, I don't care where you are. I will get you home. I'll find a way. I know somebody somewhere, if it's two states over, that will come pick you up and bring you to where you need to be. Because you have a plan to even get yourself out of a foolish decision. So I think there's part of this that is important for us to grasp. Michael, did you have something too? You're shifting around. I know you're well, got a long day. A bit, okay. When you said, what is your plan for getting out of these things? Or what is your tool for getting out of these things? Pray. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus in Matthew 6, you know, said, deliver us from evil. We can pray to be delivered from temptation. Yeah. And then we're kind of um, leaving on one side of the table now, which is, hey, what's our plan to get out of the challenging circumstance? There's another great one, too. Don't go there in the first place. And that's a bit about knowing yourself, knowing your strengths and your weaknesses, and being real about your strengths and weaknesses. Um, so I think there's a tendency in all of us to think a little more highly of ourselves than we ought to. And sometimes you gotta realize, hey, you know what, that's not really a great choice for me. Like, others might be able to manage that scenario perfectly fine, but I'm not that person. And so maybe I need to just not even be in that spot. We typically illustrate that, though, with using others. Well, you know, if you knew someone who had a problem with social drinking uh, and had cleaned themselves up, you would never want to take them to a bar, right? And so we use that illustration, but that's about somebody else. Remember, that illustration is designed to prompt you to think about you. Hey, what, what's my challenge? Um, you're in essence asking, hey, Based on my past, how did I behave as if I had walked to a bar and I was a drunkard? When does my temper tend to spike up? 
When do I make foolish financial or personal decisions? Uh, for some of us, the answer is after 12 o'clock. You know, after midnight, you know, the brain kind of shuts down. Oh, and by the way, you also know that's when most television advertisers have those all night long sales things where they sell you stuff on TV and uh, the CV uh, kind of rolls through because people tend to do that. Long day, brain's still not working at peak fa uh, faculties, and so you're more likely to spend on stuff you wouldn't otherwise get. Um, in that process, though, I want to make one little quick distinction. There is a big difference between temptation and whatever we want to classify as a trial. There are some things that God historically has laid at the feet of his people that are not temptations. They are the consequence of immorality. They are the crushing part of building you into something better. And that's different than a temptation. Um, when God brought justice and judgment to Israel because of their sin, some righteous people were caught up in that. That's not temptation at all. Um, nor are some of the things that would happen to us today that have nothing to do with our individual moral choice. Um, ramping up of consequences to those who are living righteous lives in contrast to the world's standards, um, increased taxes, financial means, or even attempt to censure your speech. Those are not temptations or trials. Um, A good component that's been added in um, is to just kind of include this. Seeking help from God and his people includes prayer, but it is not exclusive to prayer. Um, reading his, your Bible is a useful tool against the devil. You kind of know what the real standards are. Because think about this. In our great illustration of Jesus's dominance over the devil, he is presented with three different categories of trials, tests, or temptations, right? And those categories are representative of what we go through. They fit kind of the generality of mankind. But Jesus answers the devil's ploys by correct understanding of the scriptures, not solely by the demonstration of his great will, but actually by saying, hey, what you said, it's kind of true, but it's not actually true. And each of those three instances where this is brought up, that's a great point for us to recognize that a lot of our spiritual strength can be gained by just making sure we know what we're talking about. Now, that's a powerful tool to use in the face of temptation. Next component to think about is to think about um, how we interact. I don't know when this happened, um, but I want to think about it this way. What does it mean to you to be a peacemaker in light of what the New Testament teaches through Christ about being a peacemaker? In a practical way, how would one be someone who makes peace? I always thought of a mediator. Mediator is one of the roles that I think fits well there. Um, one of the jobs that a mediator in a professional setting does is translate, even if the people speak the same language. They take whatever one person says, listen to it, and say, is this what you're saying? And that person will say, yeah, that's what I'm saying. And you go back to the other person and say, well, this is what they're saying. Because it's coming from a third party, sometimes it's a little easier to digest and think about. And so a peacemaker does mediation. Um, the question then is, between whom do we mediate as examples of Christ in the world? There's two great answers to it, and e either of them are equally valid. Probably more than two, but I've got two in my head. How's that? First mediation is person to person. There are times when, as a disciple, your role 
is to negotiate a settlement between two Christians. Paul talks about it to the church of Corinth. Have you no wise? Have you no people among your own to solve these quarrels that you go to law against? So sometimes that's what Christians do. They mediate that way. But the other one is between God and man. Both of those roles are valid examples of what a Christian does serving as a peacemaker. And a way to think about this is to think about how we talk to one another. If I came to Alan and I said, Alan, you're not a very good shot at all. In fact, you're the worst shooter I've ever seen. If I had a barn, I'd hide in front of it because you couldn't hit the broad side of it. Now, I'm doing this with Alan because I know Alan's a good shot. And he's also a good sport. But is anything else I say after that going to do much good? No, because Alan is a good shot. And now I have poked at a sensitive area of his person. Like, that's important to him. He loves shooting. It's a big part of his personal identity, right? Is that fair? And now he's going to come after me afterwards, and that's perfectly fine. I'm willing to take that. But that's an important thing to think about in regards to what our role is in this big picture. Because if a peacemaker can serve in those two big areas, person to person and person to God, the primary God to person role is to draw them to Jesus, is to bring them to Christ, is to mediate that in the way that you can by your example. And your example can show what it looks like to have someone who has also been brought to Christ. Your behavior, your speech, your kindness. I don't expect, and maybe you have a different perspective, but I don't expect people who do not know Jesus to act any other way than people who don't know Jesus. I expect them to be, to differing degrees, layered up in the world's behavior. In fact, I am surprised if people who are more worldly behave righteously. I'm like, oh, that's refreshingly surprising. I didn't expect that. So when I'm trying to draw them to the cross, that's what I'm trying to do. Show them, hey, this is over here. This is what a cross-focused person can look like, and you can too. Then afterwards, a lot of those things that were worldly behaviors, that's when those get straightened out even if you talk about them because they're pertinent at the moment, because that's the sins that they're dealing with. That's important to understand that how we approach that conversation and dialogue has to include some clarity there. We can't start it off by saying you're the worst shot ever, if you're talking to Alan. But maybe you're talking to somebody else, and that's not the issue. So be aware of that from my perspective. And then that brings into the other half of Peacemaker Between People, because we have to understand what actually causes strife between two people. What's the root of conflict between one person and another? Like what makes them upset with each other? Tone. What's that? Tone. Tone is a big deal, like how it comes across. Um, at some point between the ages of like 9 and 11, there's this switch that turns on in all of us that enables 24-7 sarcasm, Right? And then all of a sudden, it kind of we learn how to control that. But sarcasm is like a part of speech. The Bible's full of it, by the way. Prophets use it too. They use it pointedly. That's the whole thing about why they talk about a whole tree being cut down and half of it being tossed to the fire and the other half of it becoming the altar. That's sarcastic speech. Um, but that's tone, right? Tone describes that. Because I can say, I love you. And I can say, I love you. And it means two different things, right? By tone. What else? What else might help us understand the source of our quarrels? Disagreement on points. Yeah, like specific issues. Like there's actually things of specificity that are real big differences like maybe it's politics. Maybe it's preferences. Maybe it's actual issues of, hey, I disagree with you about how you understand the Bible. Or maybe it even falls within the category of things 
that Jesus and Peter and James and Paul talks about, the source of their strife. And it was greed and envy. Um, you think about it this way. How many times have you seen somebody bothered because somebody else succeeded and they didn't? Well, why did they get promoted? I've been here just as long. And I worked twice as hard. Why did they get the promotion and not me? How come they're in first chair? How come they got the role? How come they're first on the depth chart? That's a normal experience in life, right? That's a source of quarrel and fighting. And realize that the Bible actually shows that that can happen amongst brethren. And it happened so regularly that they had to write about it. And it wasn't just one local church that was struggling with it. If our goal is to be a peacemaker, then it really is important then for us to first be at peace and then figure out how to become someone who builds a bridge to reconciliation. How do you reconcile with someone you love? What's the process? Not someone that's like way out there, but someone you genuinely care about. How do you reconcile with them? What's the first words that happen out of your mouth? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Right? It starts with something simple. I'm sorry. And then you specify what the problem was. I'm sorry that I did or didn't. Whatever it was. Because usually that's, that, that can fit the category, right? I'm sorry that I did this. Or I'm sorry I didn't do that. And it begins really simply. Building that bridge also requires for you to take ownership of your part of what broke it in the first place. There's a study that I remember reading all the way back. This was in 1995, and I've read variations of it ever since. That even in the most broken marriages, like where there's the most trauma, there's actually still a substantial number of things that are done in service to the other person every day. What changes is the ratio. So even in bad marriages, there can be 10 things on one table and 10 things on the other that the person is doing for the benefit of the other person. But it's when that ratio starts to rise of how much is going on that the marriages get better. So even in the worst circumstances, there's still some good that you're working from on a platform. And that gives you something to build on. And most of life is that way, too. Um, Michael, you going to jump in? Maybe. I might get in trouble after service before, but maybe. Uh, All right, let's, go. let's see how it goes. <laughs> Make your choices. Right. You're choosing to write the check right now. So how do you, how do you uh, mend these things? The words, I'm sorry. So, so Kelly and I have this rule in our marriage that if we have a disagreement and an argument, uh, when it's over and we get near the end, we both have to apologize. Because if we're both arguing, we both had some part in it. So it might be 99% one person's fault, 1% the others. So that word, I'm sorry, it helps. Even if you're not, you don't feel like you did it. You don't feel like you caused it. You were in the disagreement. You were going back and forth. Now, that was like easy to get used to after uh, 30 years. And then now it's, tr it's, it's kind of transitioned into every now and then, hey, I'm sorry, you missed up. Yeah, oh, I, I, that's, that, that's only get achievable at the 30 year mark. You can't really yeah, get to there too soon. I, I didn't get away with that at year five. I'm just for the record, it, it comes to me, not from me. Michael will also be apologizing for this later, according to the standard agreement between the two of them. Um, but the point is, <laughs> say you're sorry, because if you argue with someone, you had some part in it. It might have been 99% to one, but if you're arguing with somebody, you shouldn't be arguing. Yeah. Bobby? You can say it. Yeah, I mean, sometimes it's just as simple as, I should not have done that. I can't take those words back, or I can't take that thing back. But I can acknowledge and take ownership that I did the thing, that I said the words. It's important in all of this to embrace something that's super important, to be honest. Um, there's a preacher I know up north, and he was talking about the first three or four years of their marriage, and um, he 
like some of us, maybe many of us, really likes Chinese food. He does. And so the first few years of the marriage, they'd go to Chinese from time to time. And his wife would go along and pleasantly engage in dialogue and talk. It wasn't until they held a gospel meeting where three nights in a row they were taking out the Chinese that his wife finally said, I hate Chinese food. And I'm thinking to myself, that's a lot of years to put up with Chinese food before you express it. But that's changed his behavior. He still loves Chinese food. But if anyone ever suggests Chinese food, you know what he says? No, no, anything but Chinese. Because he cares about her opinion. And every once in a while, she'll say, hey, we should go to Chinese food tonight for you. Even though she really doesn't like it at all. It's because honesty is incredibly important if you want to have an authentic relationship. Even in areas that you don't think necessarily are that big of a deal early on, they build the tendrils to making a good one a good relationship, and to be a good example to others. Um, you think about it this way. How many of you have worked in uh, a service industry where you're dealing with people all the time? Like a lot of us have, right? And when you see someone in those areas behave with strong integrity and make a choice that hurts them, like they are at a, a store somewhere and you rang up the bill wrong, and they owe you more money, and they said, no, 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 you didn't charge me enough, or something like that in that same area where they actually make a choice to their hurt that helps some other thing. What do you think about that person when they're that honest? Do you think of them lower or better? Better, right? And you actually comment about it. That's so great. Or you see someone who found a wallet in the park and they turned it back in and all the money that was in there is still there. That's, an, that's honest behavior. That's the kind of thing that really reflects the character of our king. Jesus had that high level of integrity in all of his dealings. We can see it monetarily from time to time or maybe relationally. But it's really important to make sure that it's actually part of the wholeness of whom we are. And that little illustration of Chinese food matters too. Because that's what builds a real relationship. Because think about it. What if she had never mentioned it? And she just knuckled under and had Chinese food for five, ten years. What does that do to a person on the other end of that choice? If you don't like Chinese food and yet you're going there all the time because someone else does, how do you feel about that person eventually? Resentment? Bitter? Hey, can't we just go to like Arby's for once, you know, or anywhere else? Like, isn't there something else we could choose? Why does it always have to be this way? That's the seed for a broken relationship, where if there's some clarity there or openness, now it becomes better, because you've talked about it. Feelings, then, can become processed better, and that unconditional honesty in that regard also helps when the moment comes for you to talk about Jesus. Because your goal, as a disciple, isn't just to be a beacon or a standard of morality, be the kind of beacon that says, hey, this is where Jesus is. If you want to learn about him, you can find him by talking to me and I can show you where the cross is. You're trying to redirect. And I think a lot of that has to do with how we care about people. Like what drives our, you know, our connection to that bind their wounds metaphorically or realistically. Um, because Galatians chapter 6 and verse 2 tells us, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Just thinking about that verse to begin with, how would we accomplish that process of bearing someone's burden? Even before we get to the outcome of completing or fulfilling the law of Christ. How do you care for someone else's load? Be money. It 
It could be manual labor. Yeah, sometimes the load is actually literal. I can't keep up with all of this. There's too much of it and only one of me. How am I going to ever get all of this done? Um, years ago, I can't remember the first time I heard it, but it stuck in my head. Many hands make for light work. And so every time we get a group task going, that echoes back in the back of my noggin. Many hands make for light work. Because it does, right? You get more done in less time, the more laborers show up to the endeavor. Always. And it lifts spirits. You feel better afterwards. That's physical stuff. Do you know it works in the, in the emotional and the spiritual side as well? But it requires for us to figure out what the burden is. And all of us struggle at times with telling people how we're doing. Think about it this way. How many times in the last six months has someone asked you how you were doing? And you had to think for a moment on how you wanted to answer that question. Like, the culturally acceptable answer to this question is fine. But is fine actually accurate in most cases? No, I'm not fine. In fact, I'm a little less than fine. I'm bothered. My stomach hurts. My arm doesn't work just right anymore. Um, it took me five minutes to stand up out of bed today because my body decided just to work against me. I'm worried about my kids. I'm worried about someone else's kids. I got five people I got to call today, and all those phone calls are going to be not fun whatsoever. But we say, I'm fine. So it requires a relationship to exist where you feel enough confidence that you can say some or all of that, and they're going to look at you and go, all right, how can we fix it? Or if we can't fix it, how can I support you while you fix it? Or if nobody can fix it, how can I support you in spite of the fact that it can't be fixed? or that we can't fix it. Those are incrementally not always where we're at, right? Because if you just met somebody, are you ready to spill your guts? And by the way, even the person you think is really outgoing and always spilling their guts, they're holding some back too. Something I learned now, I guess it's been 25 years since I've taken phone calls for local churches during the week. And what do you think the majority of those phone calls are? Based on experience, I've seen, I see some people talking about it. It's about money, right? It falls into two categories. Either someone's calling to sell me something. Hey, do you want to switch over to this, the most, this, this week? Do you want to switch over to um, our gospel-centric phone system? I'm like, I, what, what are you talking about? We can save you money on your phones. I don't even want to use this one, is my answer to her. She's like, what do you mean? I'm like, I only get two calls here. Calls for someone selling us someone or the uh, something or... Someone saying, hey, here's my story, and I can't afford to pay for my bills this week. I've learned, though, in that second group that all of them are effectively not telling me the truth. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're intentionally lying. It's that they don't trust me enough to tell me what the real problem is. Because if they say, well, I don't get my bills, the real problem isn't that they can't pay their bills. That's the symptom. The problem is six or seven steps back. But they're not going to tell me, and I don't expect them to. Like, I'm not looking for that. But that's because they don't know me. Now, they may still not want to tell me if they knew me better, but having an authentic relationship should allow and enable us to maybe cross that bridge a little sooner and be able to have someone to bear your burden. And by the way, no amount of standardized relationship makes that journey easy. Oh, they're married. Of course they bear each other's burdens. That takes a lot of training to get there, right? Michael was talking about how it took them 30 years to get to this part where they can kind of joke about it a little bit. And again, I'm probably writing a check for myself there at that point, and I'm going to have to apologize to the two of them later, too. I don't know. Uh, but you think about that. It takes time. It also takes time to learn 
enough about another person to know. So part of that is in that, where we're trying to figure this out. Like, hey, I know you're troubled, but also know this. They might not even know what the trouble is. They might be upset, but not know why they are upset. Bearing someone's burden, not only when they tell you, also tells, takes place when nobody knows what the problem is yet. Michael? I think about bearing someone's burden there, letting the temptation of their struggle in life. A lot of the times, bearing their burden is going to be being a very good listener. You know, just, just let them talk. Let's know the standard method for that is to smack it at something until it works, right? Yeah, I think we'll want to start, uh, start thinking about a new solution to that. Here's something really important, and this comes from Matthew 25, um, is that, verse 31 and following, by the way, how we care for people is actually truly intertwined to the gospel's message. You've got to care about someone enough to build a relationship with them deep enough that you can say to them, even as simple as, hey, would you come to church with me? Do you realize that how hard it is for someone to go to a church they've never been before to before? Look, some of us, look, I'll go to just about any church whatsoever and go in, and I'm totally fine. I feel like it's an adventure. But I also recognize I am not your typical individual that way, right? In fact, when I visit somewhere, my kids and my, and my wife, they're probably like, that's enough. It's time for you to leave now because we're hungry. Like that's their behavior. And I'll just keep staying there forever. But a lot of folks who maybe don't go to church at all, there's a lot that has to take place for them to be willing to walk through those doors or that door. And when they're here, you know how they feel? They feel like every single person is judging them constantly. Even if that's not actually taking place. Here are things I've heard said by visitors to congregations where I've been um, after they visited, where I've called them up again and said, hey, everything go okay? Hey, tell me how it went. How'd you feel if I got a good relationship with them? Like, well, I, I felt like I didn't fit in because of the way I dressed. And to be fair, I am not the person to deal with that because I have no remembrance of what people wear and in absence of someone helping me make colors match, it's not going to happen because I just don't care. Like my concern for that stuff is about zero. Um, so like I don't care about any of that. Other folks do a lot. Me, eh, whatever. Is it clean on top of the pile? If it fits, we're good. But a lot of folks are very impacted by that and they feel ways that really matter. And that's just one illustration of it. Or... Why were people asking me what I do for a living? Do they want my money? Or why do they ask about where I, if I moved into the area or where I'm from or who do I know? Why do they want to know so much about me? I don't know them. Do they want something from me? That's not just a one-time thing. That's an every-time thing in talking to people who visit places because it's an incredible investment to spend an hour for someone who has not done that recently or ever in their life in a church assembly. And we can be totally chill about it and actually not think any of those things that they're thinking, but that doesn't change how they feel. Here's an example to it. Um, in the last year, have any of you who worship here regularly and the rentals are included because they've been here like three or four times in the last couple of weeks, felt like the sermon was directed to your life at that point in time. Like I, like I said something or someone else who was preaching for us said something, I'm like, hey, do they know what's been going on? Like I felt that way about stuff our visitors have said. You guys aren't afraid, afraid to answer, right? That's fine, you can tell me later. But I've heard that over the years. For the most part, preachers don't do that. I plan so far ahead, there's no way I could know what's going on in someone's life to plan my sermon to attach to somebody's immediate day. So if we feel that way, imagine how they feel that way. They feel like everything's targeted at them because they're the visitor. 
Well, realize that our ability to care about them is our primary tool to make them feel comfortable, to really care, to have a real connection. And that's just some of the stuff. The clock is at 7.45, and so we got the clock it right there. Um, and I'm sure Les is going to try to make the bell go off here in a second, too. Next week, we're going to continue our conversation. It'll attach in a little bit to our dialogue regarding temptation. But next week's subject is going to be focusing in on overcoming the world. By the way, that's more than just an individual endeavor. Uh, that's, a, that's part of the key of the conversation, that overcoming the world is not something you do alone or on your own. That's it for tonight. Thanks, everybody.